Yeah. European stocks this. have been rallying recently. Yeah. Are they complacent? Are investors complacent about what is happening here? I think they are complacent. Effectively, they were very scared about immediate disruptions from the, from the war, especially on energy supplies. Since then, European gas prices down 50% since early uh, March. So stocks are saying we haven't seen any negative macro news yet, so we're waiting. But the, macro news, the negative macro news is going to come, the PMI is going to roll over, growth momentum is going to roll over, and stocks will have to respond. What about earnings momentum, Sebastian? What kind of pricing power are European companies in particular able to exercise in the face of really, really high inflation? Um, we've got a great margin proxy in Europe, which is the uh, input price component of the PMI relative to the output price component. And we've just seen, hands down, the, the strongest deterioration, the worsening of the margin outlook that we've seen at any point over the last 20 years. If you take a step back, over the last two years, 12-month forward earnings expectations have risen by 60%, given slowing growth and a deteriorating margin outlook. That means we're at the top of the earnings cycle. And from here, likely we're going to see earnings downgrades. Europe tends to like bonds, tends to like investing in bonds. Um, are bonds going to become significantly more attractive? How does the relationship work? There are some people talking about the fact that the ECB is going to have to tighten policy significantly from here. Some are even debating the possibility of a 50 basis point hike. How would European equities respond to a 50 basis point hike from the ECB? So as a rule of thumb, and uh, your colleague was already saying, it's the real bond yield that matters. That's yep. the discount rate for equities. Real bond yields have been shooting up. That has compressed multiples. Multiples are down by 20% over the last two years. But but I'm, I'm saying for the last two years, you always had to say central banks are underpriced. They're going to do significantly more than what is priced. After all that hawkish repricing that we've seen, I think we're pretty much at the end of the, the hawkish repricing, okay. especially if the macro data now starts to soften. Okay, so what, how does that translate into a thesis for European banks in particular, Sebastian? Um, we've been overweight uh, European banks for two years. We've closed our overweight in the middle of February, and we see no further upside because, A, we hmm. see no further upside to nominal bond yields. That's what you really need to see for banks' outperformance. And then a very helpful secondary indicator is growth momentum in the euro area. We think that's going to go down. And thirdly, credit spreads, uh, which have now a lot of scope to widen. So if you have no more bond yield upside, growth momentum weakening, credit spreads going up, that's not a nice combination for banks. Which area in particular, other than banks, are going to be, uh, are going to be suffering here? You, the London market's been outperforming because of commodities. Correct. Energy's done well. Metals and miners have done well. Does that continue? Is that trade over? There are some suggesting that, and JP Morgan is one of these, suggesting that you could see even a 40% upside to commodity prices. If we see a reallocation away from equities to commodities as commodities become the inflation hedge rather than equities. I think it's very unlikely because... Um, Typically, what you need for commodities to go up is accelerating growth, stronger demand, and a weaker dollar, a better commodity affordability. The current rally is very unusual because it has taken place against the backdrop of slowing growth and a stronger dollar. That means you've just priced in a huge supply risk premium. The next part of the story, I believe, will be commodity markets like equities will have to focus on the weakening demand outlook, and that is clearly negative for commodity prices, and it's not yet priced in. Okay, so then where do you hide, Sebastian? Yeah. Um, I would say generally, um, you go underweight the cyclicals, you go overweight the defensives. I think it's very, what's very important in investing is always to be aware right now, what is the main macro narrative? And it's very clear, it's the loss of growth momentum. Look at the China PMI, it's already at 45. There's downside to US growth momentum. There clearly is downside to European growth momentum, given that you're about to experience a large energy price shock. Um, so you look at the defensives, you want to be overweight, but only those that haven't priced uh, in the slowdown yet. Pharma has already priced it. Pharma has gone through the roof, even as bonnets have risen and the market has rallied. So I think that, that is already discounting all the economic pain. But if you look at utilities, food and beverages, personal household goods, they have a lot of scope to outperform. Stock 600, SXXP, 455, Sport 58 right now. What's the downside? Down to 410, so around 10%, to mm. fully reflect this kind of slowdown scenario. Is there, I guess that, is that the middle of the distribution? I, is there a downside risk to that model? I think so, because uh, I think we're very conservative, assuming the PMIs only dip mildly below 50. Um, when you had a similar loss of consumer purchasing power, like the one you're seeing right now, that was during the euro area crisis, the PMIs dropped to uh, yeah. 44. That's minus 3% GDP growth. So if we're saying we're just marginally going below 50, I think we're very conservative. All right, let's get a little more specific within Europe, Sebastian. We broke the news in the previous hour about the latest polling out from France ahead of that election on Sunday. And maybe it's not even Sunday that matters, but actually ultimately the runoff. There's now just four points separating Macron from Le Pen. What is your feeling on France with the risk potentially of Marine Le Pen 
in that seat. Um, I think if you want to tell a po positive story about Europe is that you've seen tremendous political unity over the past month, which certainly is very encouraging, and it's important to, to be um, able to address the geopolitical challenges, but also to have a powerful fiscal response. You only get that with a pro-EU um, president like Macron. If you get uh, Marine Le Pen, I, the outside uh, uh, risk materializing, fiscal coordination in Europe will get a lot more difficult and therefore responding to the downturn that is now in the pipeline will become harder. Okay, so potentially a negative on the macro front. So all, pull this all together for me. How should I be thinking tactically over the next year of playing this? Do I want to take some dry powder and put it on the side right now? Wait for the opportunities to emerge. How are you thinking tactically throughout the rest of this year in terms of entry points? How much volatility are we going to get? Are there going to be good entry points? Is the pendulum going to swing too far? How are you thinking about this? Yeah, so, so what I would say is num the number one driver of asset prices normally is growth momentum. That was not the case. Growth momentum wasn't really doing anything at the beginning of the year, so it was all about rising bond yields. I think bond yields have no further upside effectively, but it's too early to buy bonds because you still have this central bank narrative effectively uh, in the final stages. So if you have, if you take a step back, two years of phenomenal asset price returns because you've seen one of the strongest recoveries, effectively all the risk premium being priced out of markets, out of credits, out of equities, you have to take into consideration a period of low returns, especially if you have a loss of growth momentum. So I think for now it's really a good moment. Put some money into cash, get out of the equity market, position defensively, and then watch out for the next catalyst that can bring about an acceleration, but it's not yet on the horizon. What would one of those catalysts even look like, Sebastian? One that would be positive at least? I think there are two catalysts that are uh, possible, uh, at least at the moment. We don't think they will materialize. The first one is large-scale uh, fiscal policy in the EU. But as we've seen once more, that typically is very reactive. Proactive fiscal policy in the EU would be delightful, but we never <laughs> see it. <laughs> and then the second positive would be uh, policy stimulus in China. I think policymakers right. in China have a lot of reason to be nervous. You've, uh, you're locking down large parts of the country, including the whole of Shanghai, because of the, the rise of COVID cases. And you have an unresolved debt crisis in the property sector. For now, you've seen very little stimulus, but that's the most likely positive catalyst, that effectively they lose their nerves, put um, more stimulus into the system. Um, and that's something uh, that we really then would have to think about, whether that bearish thesis we've just been discussing still holds in that scenario. One final quick question from me. What euro dollar exchange rate are you plugging in? What broader exchange rates are you plugging into your models right now? So um, we think this is a, a period that is, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the death of the dollar and is it going to lose its preeminent st status. If you've got slowing growth, rising macro uh, uncertainty and a particular hit to the macro cycle in Europe, that is still an, uh, an environment that's very positive for the dollar. We see around 4 to 5% upside for the broad dollar trade weighted. Our FX strategists think the euro dollar goes down to uh, 105 and mm -hmm. effectively that is a scenario where the dollar benefits from weaker growth, higher yeah. macro uncertainty. I think that's still the most likely outcome.